Welcome back, everyone, to yet another episode of the Essays and Espresso podcast. I am your host, Daniel, and I'm joined by, you know, these miserable fucks, uh, Acer and Boken. Yes. What's up, guys? That's me. That is also me. I noticed, Daniel, that you, you, you had to save the beginning of the podcast because it sounded like you were introducing us back from a break. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, whatever. <laughs> so today's essay topic, before I was rudely interrupted by this miserable you fuck. Interrupted. You interrupted. You, I interrupt. You introduced me. Yes. I introduced you, but you still interrupted me because you, you suck. All right. Did games writing have a turning point? So we were talking about last week and last episode about... Um, People saying that the uh, the Last of Us was like this turning point for games writing, so this is the natural evolution of that discussion. Well, we'll talk about that after the break. Um, Lisa, stop typing. Before that, I can hear you. Hold I'll, on, this I'll, is a really edit, funny joke. I'll edit it in post. It's, it's not. It's not. It's not a big deal. <laughs> Didn't you like my joke though? <sighs> Didn't see it. Move no. on. Anyways, so. I didn't have a lot done this week, unfortunately. Uh, I was actually busy reading the Watchmen comic book, which is going to be for a spoiler cast. But I did, uh, I did do a, a couple of things. So hold on, just one second. We didn't actually announce that, did we? That we that Acer yeah. chose Watchmen. Yes. I, I this this is the announcement. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yes. Hard, hard fought negotiations. I gave up on Yu Gi Oh to get Watchmen. And then I got Yu-Gi-Oh too, so everything's good. I hate you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Watchmen's going to be the next spoiler cast. The the, the comic book and maybe the movie. Yes, maybe definitely just the, movie the movie. From memory. Definitely okay. I guess I have to rewatch <laughs> the movie. Which version of the movie? The extended three and a half hours no. version. Or the theatrical cut. You know what? People need to get over the Lord of the Rings extended editions. The theatrical cuts are way better. I don't know. Thank I haven't. Thank I you. haven't seen the Lord of the Rings in a long time, and I don't really. I don't really care to watch them again. I remember watching the extended cuts, and it was like I don't remember them adding anything substantial. No, it's just like, oh, it's me, Gandalf, and I'm gonna tell you the tale of when I met this jackass. And it's just like a, a five-minute scene of Merry and Pippin eating apples in like flooded Isengard or some crap. It's terrible. It completely breaks the pacing of those movies. I like the scene yeah. where Saruman was killed, but everything else I think is completely omittable. It, 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 I do think it's very interesting sometimes is to see a di- the like what's better, a director's cut or a theatrical cut. Because sometimes the theatrical cut is better because it trims the fat. But sometimes a director's cut is better because in an effort to trim the fat, sometimes very valuable scenes are lost. So mm-hmm. there, there's merits to both. And yeah. I think it's interesting when I uh, would like to see you know, the, one uh, ends up better than the other. I would like to see the original four-hour cut of The Dark Knight Rises. I, uh, whoa, that, that exists? That exists. I had no idea. Uh, is that is that like a rumor or no, is that no, something you uh, can buy? When you can't buy it, uh, Christopher Nolan said before the movie was anna- before the movie released, he said that he's currently just editing it down. It's currently four hours long, and he's gonna make it uh, shorter. Mm. This was like uh, this was like nine years ago. He said this, and we haven't seen it since. He just decided never to like release that cut. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, man, even, despite imagine, the fact that I uh, imagine if movies were like video essays, where one one guy brings out like a six-hour movie, then everyone else is, "Whoa, I can beat that!" Uh, and then, <laughs> no, for seven and eight-hour movies, just watch them. At two I mean, there the there are movies that are that long. They're, they're, it's not common, but they yeah, exist. it's not common at all. Unlike in the video essay stratosphere. <laughs> Yeah, but does you anybody seem, watch... You sound bitter. <laughs> I'm kind of bitter, <laughs> does, yes. 
Does anybody watch those videos? I feel like people put them on in the background while they do something else. Yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah. It's just... So um, it's, not, it's not the same oh, way fuck. of engaging with the media. I mean, it depends for me. Like, Logan, did you get swatted? <laughs> no, I got a call. Oh. And unlike you, I didn't answer it. Because I'm doing serious <laughs> business on a serious podcast. Hey, I'll have you know that my dad invited me to have salt meat and bean soup. A traditional Icelandic food. Okay. Here I got a call from juice. my grandma. She might be hurt or something, but I'm not going to answer. <laughs> she may have slipped in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you better not You better not come to us next time we record and tell us that that actually happened, because then I'm going to feel pretty bad. <laughs> That'd be pretty awful. Anyways, so... I did read a book recently, and just just for Boken's sake, because he's such an anal retentive little shit. Um, I listened to the audiobook version. That's basically uh, the same sake. as reading it. <laughs> Shut the up, Twitter grandma! Poll confirmed. <laughs> Your grandma's still calling you. Yes. Uh, She's probably confused because I I hung up on her, and she has no idea what that means. <laughs> like oh something must have gone wrong little poken why aren't you responding i got a message guys hold on what the fuck <laughs> i'm joking <laughs> uh okay please go on also i did a vote on whether or not listening to an audiobook is reading an audiobook uh, is reading a book and overwhelmingly okay overwhelmingly voted yes Yes, it was exactly 66 to 33 percent of like 80 votes yes all right i feel like that's a pretty good uh you know poll okay well uh just to be clear i'm going to be talking about two books uh one i listened to the audiobook version and one i actually read so uh the this one that i'm going to talk about is the audiobook version which is story style structure substance and the principles of screenwriting by Robert McKee. So, uh, this book was really interesting, and it was, it's as like the, the very long title suggests, it's a lot of uh, screenwriting advice. I didn't know that going into it. I didn't know it was going to be very focused on screenwriting. So, uh, if anyone that is listening to this and is interested, keep that in mind. While I do think a lot of the advice that is given in the book is, can overlap with general writing advice just know that it's geared towards that specifically mm. and um there was a lot of like really great nuggets of of insight and and wisdom in the book that i really appreciated so one part that i really enjoyed was robert said like look when you're when you're pitching a movie and you know when you're pitching your story if it if your 10 minute version that you explain to your friends doesn't have them engaged, then what makes you think it's going to be any better when it's blown up to two hours? And the way he got this across was by explaining the plot of a movie called D I think it's called Diabolique. I don't, I, think I don't know if either one. of you have seen it. Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil the movie. But um, I'll, I'll just say that while he it was explaining the plot, like I was on the edge of my seat. Well, literally, because I was driving my car. But, you know, I was like really entranced by everything that he was saying, you know, all the details that he that he was explaining. And, you know, it took him roughly like 10 minutes. And then that after that is when he explained like, yeah. You know, if if your if your story has issues within that ten minute span, it's only going to get worse. You know, when it's turned into a movie, those because those problems are still going to be there, and they're going to be exacerbated because they're being stretched out. But if you have your your audience at the edge of their seat, just by your ten minute summary, and by the end of it, they go, "Wow," you know then you have something just like I had you when I explained the plot summary to Diabolique. And I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Uh, that is pretty I don't know. Cool. 
I like I, I don't want to pretend like I don't know more about screenwriting than whoever Robert McKee is, but I feel like that's very dependent on the genre. And I mean, you know, what if I have like very awesome vistas in CGI? Maybe that's going to catch up, capture my audience. Well, we all know that a CGI without a, a special effect without a story is a pretty boring <laughs> mm. thing. Ah, uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. But um, um, I, I just looked up what Diabolique is. I, I don't know it. It's a 1955 film. Um, and from this, the summary, it sounds like a mystery crime drama. And it's like, you know, that's obviously a good read if you, you know, just bring down the plot to its plot points of, oh, what is going to happen next? But if I'm writing like a a regular drama like Marriage Stories, that going to sound good in a 10-minute uh, summary? Or is that carried by, you know, maybe the cinematography well, or I the actors can, uh, or the dialogue? Yeah, but you would go like, oh, it has Kylo I Ren mean, and Scarlett Johansson and everyone would become engaged immediately. I don't think the screenwriter can make that call. I mean, I would I would still argue that like even in a movie that is uh that there's a lot of emphasis on its cinematography, uh if you still if you don't have an interesting story to go with it, then it's still going to fail. It's not going to be an interesting movie. Well, I mean, I could tell you a bunch of action movies where that isn't the case, but uh, I guess you could be very descriptive I, yeah. in your words to try to build an atmosphere. Well, you know, it's also important to note that whom you're selling the movie to matters. So if the person is really interested in how you present the movie, the cinematography and all that, they're probably going to be a lot more intrigued with that version of the uh, draft or summary than a person who's more inclined to like stories or funny characters. I think I think you also need to keep in mind that this is screenwriting advice, as you know. So like, yeah. when you're, I think he he described the situation as like, oh, you're describing it to your friends, but I think that's also meant to be extrapolated to you're pitching it to like a studio. Like you need to be able to sell them on your your story in 10 minutes as well i think that i think that's also what he was trying to get at yeah i think i think that's uh maybe that version of it is better the idea of having a solid short version of the product to sell before you make the big one mm -hmm. yeah um another piece of advice that he gave that i thought was really insightful uh was a un a convincing impossibility is better than an unconvincing possibility. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. Give me and an it, example. And it immediately reminded me of Code Geass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because... I, I remember, <laughs> just as a bit of a segue, when we were talking about Madoka Magica, I, I just remembered, you know, I, I made a bit of a fuss about them being you know showing you know a bit like uh they smash zoom to their chest or to their legs or whatever but then i uh i didn't have that hang up with code Geass, which was just the exact same thing on steroids i didn't even honestly i think you were reading too deep into yeah, how maybe because <laughs> i don't think the intention at all with madoka magica was no, for, I don't think except they, except for maybe mommy because she has big tits. Yeah, maybe her, I but just, the other girls. I just no. think it's funny that I made a fuss about sexualization of Madoka Magica. I didn't have that problem with Code Geass. Code Geass. <laughs> maybe because Code Geass had the better story. I was more invested in the character. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm sorry. Go, 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 let's talk about Robert McKay again. <laughs> but no, that, that immediately made me think of Code Geass because, you know, there's several moments in Code Geass that you could argue is technically plausible within the constraints of the rules that was created within the world. But, but just, aren't... Yeah. 
but they're not convincing because either it's not consistent or like when Euphemia gets shot once and dies compares to Mao who gets turned into Swiss cheese and yet survived somehow. Like Because of an offhand comment where he talks about the wonders of Britannian <laughs> medical technology. <laughs> Yeah, like, like the fucking princess can't get that. Yeah, like she, she gets in, or or fucking what's her name? Valletta gets shot in the fucking stomach and somehow gets amnesia. Yeah, what? <laughs> like, is that technically possible? I, maybe. Is how it convincing? You, Hell no. How did you like the one where they just? wiped Lelouch's memories and replay like go back to school again like would you really <laughs> do two. that like would you really do <laughs> that <laughs> like even if you wanted to keep him alive wouldn't you just throw him in prison or something oh god <laughs> um but uh go- going back to the book um uh, one more thing I'll say about the okay, book wait wait uh, there was what, one... what is a, a, an example of a convincing impossibility Oh, uh, he gave an example. I can't quite remember it at the moment, uh, unfortunately. But it was it was it was so stu- it was so something that really stuck in my mind because uh, it it really resonated because it makes sense, right? Like it it it's supposed to evoke like the magic of movie making, where you could do something that technically isn't possible but you if you're doing if you do it confidently enough then you can sell the audience on it yeah um but one other part that i that i really liked was he broke down a scene from a movie called chinatown with um jack nicholson yeah jack nicholson i was gonna say um there, I haven't seen this movie yet, but reading the book made me want to watch the movie. He said there was like there's one part where uh, him and this other female character that he's in love with are having like a huge argument. I'm not going to go into the specifics just because he spoiled it, but I'm not. I don't want to spoil it for you guys. But, I've seen it. But what oh, you're talking he to the audience. does? Sorry. What? Yeah. <laughs> what is it? I. I. It's nothing. I. I didn't notice you were talking to the audience. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but he, he basically explained the line of thinking behind every, behind every line of dialogue for each character, because what Robert was trying to get across was you need to really understand and know your characters. You need to understand why your characters are making these kinds of decisions. So Every piece of dialogue needs to be important. There needs to, and for each dialogue to be important, there needs to be a line of thinking behind that dialogue in order for your character to feel like a fully fleshed out character. Hmm. Kojima, so, Kojima did not read this book, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> although, although, you know who did? Who? Chris Avalon. Sam Barlow. Oh. Sam Barlow is also he, good. Sam Barlow wrote her story and Telling Lies and uh, Shattered Memories, by, uh, you know, the Silent Hill game. So, uh, Wasn't he yes. also involved with the new God of War game? Or am I, uh, was he? I may be confusing him for someone else. I don't think so. I don't think he he did. Is, Sam Bar- is Shattered Memories a good game? I've never played it, and I hear mixed things. As as a game, it's not great. But of the post Team Silent Silent Hill games, it absolutely has the best story. Oh wait a minute! He also worked on Silent Hill Origins, which I don't love. Uh, I didn't know that. Did he write that one? Uh, lead designer and writer. So yeah. Hmm. He didn't work on well, uh, God of War, but we won't hold that against. Well, him. I think I think this. I, well, to be fair, I think I think the problem with most of the post Team Silent games 
is that they try to like mess with the lore and they try to like add to it and change things. And I think the strength of Shattered Memories is that it tries to be its own thing. <clears throat> like yeah. it's a it's like a pseudo reimagining of sorts of the first Silent Hill, kind of sort of not really. Um, and and by kind of break breaking the shackles of like adhering to the lore and stuff and kind of doing its own thing, it makes it makes for a much more interesting and uh, uh, much more unique story. Yeah. But yeah. Anyways, um, that was story by Robert McKee. I recommend it. He has another book called uh, Dialogue that I'm going to probably check out. He has another one called uh, Storynomics that I'd like to check out. So uh, if I get around to them, I'll let you know who they are. Yes. Cool. Let's see. I also, I'll probably pick uh, that book up. It's good. I recommend it. Um, I also watched the Witcher TV show, and I read the first couple of chapters of the last wish which is the very first witcher book i think there are like seven witcher books the first two witcher books are a collection of short stories and then after that uh the other five books are like one long arcing story and from my understanding the first season of the witcher tv show uh, handpicks a few of these short stories from the first two books. So, uh, one of the early chapters of The Last Wish is one of the episode, uh, like, did get adapted into one of the episodes, which is the Striga. So, I'm going to mainly focus on that. Um, the differences between how the episode handled the uh, the chapter, like, the differences were were pretty striking to me. So, first off, uh, Geralt in the book seemed a lot more vicious. Like, he seemed a little bit more, uh, I guess, reasonable in the in the in the episode. But in the book, like when he. Okay, actually, I almost forgot. Like, a really big difference is it seemed like in the in the show, um, the events of the Shrigger was, like, more of a, a recent happening. Like, it's something that just occurred. Mm-hmm. Um, while in the book, it, it was uh, something that had been going on for, like, seven years. Like, this, is, this has been, like, plaguing this little town for, like, a fucking long time. And... This was something that, like, uh, Geralt had heard about, and he wanted to get in on because he wanted the money. Uh, but in the in the show, he kind of stumbles into it. Hmm. Not only that, but in the show, um, the king tries to keep things more under wraps because there's a, there's like in there was incest that happened, um, while in the book. The king was more open about it. He was just like, yeah, I fucked my sister. <laughs> <You> know, like... <laughs> He's like the king of Midland. Mm. That beloved, mm. lovable old chap. Mm. Yes. So what is Midland? Berserk. Uh, Berserk. Oh. You've read Berserk, right? No. Oh. You never read it? <laughs> no. Did you ever watch it? Yes. Oh, okay. okay. You remember how Griffith uh, had sex with the princess and was thrown in the torture chamber? Yeah, that was a good scene. Yeah, it was a good scene. Do you want to know what happened in the manga afterwards? No. No. Okay, let's move on. Okay. So, the the book, as you can imagine, is a lot more detailed compared to the show. So... But the thing is, the show also changed a lot of details and added stuff. So Tris Tris Marigold was in that episode, despite the fact that she wasn't in the book. Um, there was also another witcher that tried to kill the Striga in the episode. And while there was kind of sort of a thing about other another witcher, actually there were two witchers in the book. Uh, one tried to fight the sugar and got killed, but another one was about to 
fight the Striga, but decided, eh, not going to do it. And there's more details revealed as to why in the book. While in the show, there was one witcher tried to fight it and just got fucking axed. Mm. So in the book, it's building up more to like, there's like a mystery. Like there's, there's more going on than what meets the eye. While I guess in the show, it's a little more straightforward. Um, overall, I think the book handled it a lot better. Um, it's... It, it it was very it's very weird watching like certain scenes get adapted but then like was twisted and there were certain scenes that were absent that I felt should have been there it was weird um that's not to say that the show did it poorly like I still think that it's a good episode but mm, yeah it was weird I I I want to I want to read more chapters and i want to read more uh the second book as well to see what stories did and didn't get adapted and i'll come back later and tell you how that turns out um but having finished the witcher tv show i thought it was pretty good i liked it all right I'm, i don't know i don't know if my opinion how much my opinion will change after i read the books though so we'll see probably a bit i mean i've i thought the show was okay i really hated the first episode and from what i heard uh, the the in the books, that episode is also way better, or the chapter, or whatever. I only watched like twenty minutes of the first episode before I gave up. The show gets better. It does, but it yes, never it, reaches. It does. It does. Like, it, it's. It. I don't even know what to say I'm, I'm about not, it. It's I'm just not looking. It's okay. I'm not looking for Breaking Bad with this show. No, it's it's enjoyable. It has fun characters. The CGI is pretty awful at times. Yeah, the C- the CGI is bad. Um, the thing, like, have you played the Witcher games? Yeah, I've played like everyone okay, see, else. I've played like ten minutes of uh, <laughs> the Witcher Three. <laughs> Were you like okay, everyone cause... else? That game didn't take off at all. <laughs> yeah, Witcher Two. So is, like, I incredible. haven't I haven't played any of the Witcher games. So I think that may be why I probably enjoyed the show more than you did because. I didn't have any preconceived notions. Um, yeah, the, my, but, my preconceived yeah. notions being like undercut or whatever. That wasn't the problem. See, I, I actually really liked the first episode, so I don't, I don't know why you hated really? it. That yeah? was, I had a just, that wasn't because I like the games. It was generally that I didn't understand what was happening and I didn't understand the characters' motivations because they didn't really develop them. Mm. Like they, they, they I, did. I did. I didn't have any problems following what was happening. Uh, I mean, I can understand what is happening on a plot point basis, but not why the characters do what they do. Why Geralt goes back, how he falls in love with her. Oh no 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 no! He didn't fall in love. No, you made that up. He ca- he he didn't give a shit about her, and then he comes back, and suddenly, didn't they s- have sex? And then that doesn't mean they're in he, love. He like kind of tries to protect her. He just he starts getting very involved in this thing that he didn't want to be involved in at all. And from what I heard, she's she's a witch who has some powers of seduction. Or mind control, but that wasn't really developed at all or shown, and so it just became. I I didn't understand why the fuck girl came back at all. He could have just walked. Because away. it's. I, I think. Be, I think that was more so within his character. Like he can't help himself but to help. No. Like maybe that's my un, my understanding being undercut because that's not Geralt really. Mm, and and okay. he, he at the that, beginning of that's the episode how I he expressed it. that he doesn't care and that he's not going to get involved. See, because the way that I internalize his character was that's a facade, that's him, like putting up an act, but deep down he does care, and he just doesn't. He tries his best not to care so that he doesn't get hurt, but it ends up happening well, anyway. That's certainly part of his character. It's just. He usually does that with old friends because he has a wide circle of friends and she wasn't one of them. I mean, it could also, I guess, could be possible. It's because she 
did have some powers over him like maybe she did do something i i don't i don't think that's what happened but i guess that's possible i don't like making that assumption though because it like you said it wasn't really developed enough to to really warrant that being taken into consideration if that's what they were going for i'd say that didn't work but again for me i think it comes across more like this is part of his character like he can't help but help which is it's just have who he is repressed or no emotions that's part of their, their, their i don't trait. think that's true it is though like throughout through but throughout the show Geralt gets emotional a lot uh, mm. he try like he tries to suppress his emotions as much as possible but there are times where he can't help himself and he does get really fucking pissed yes that's the emotion he gets he's like somewhere between annoyed and angry most of the time but when he does and get with, like positively yeah. emotionally involved it's usually more from a appreciation of the people he's around with but i i'm pretty sure that if you become a witcher your emotional state is is reduced heavily Prob- probably probably no that's but the law I'd st- for sure mm, okay Maybe I don't know. I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm the Witcher noob here. I don't really know it, so no, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure the comments I'm, will correct. I'm, I'm the Witcher noob, Daniel. Um, but you know, in, in that line of thinking, though, you were saying like he he helps people that he appreciates. I think on some level, he also saw a part of himself in this character, right? Like she, I remember she asked him like, "Hey, you know these these people." treat me like shit, you know, if you were in the same, same situation, why wouldn't you kill them, you know, like, they're calling me a monster, and blah, 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 like, and he's, and his response was, because then I am what they, what they say I am, so I think on some level, he probably related to her, and could, like, sympathize with what she was going through, and I think that may have also influenced why he decided to help her, because he, he saw, like, a little bit of himself, and that, empathy you know led him to you know making arguably a bad decision lots of bad decisions but also i remember she, yeah. he has a scene with her where she tries to hire him and she he sh- he says no then he goes to the sorcerer and he tries to hire him and he also tells him to fuck off and then he goes back to the girl and then they start getting involved <laughs> for some reason even though he like he told both sides, I don't give a fuck about your problems. I'm going to go. But he doesn't go. And I was just sitting well, there. I think, it, again, like, Why I think it's happening? again, I think it's because, well, in the beginning, he didn't know anything about her. And then he started to relate to her more as the episode well, went yes, on. He but, started but to only learn after more he came her. back for no reason. I don't think it was for no reason. I think we need to move on because we've already talked half an hour about your first topic. <laughs> He's had okay. two. No, All yeah, right, I've had two. The topics. second topic. Uh, well, the 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 Witcher topic. Anyways, whatever. Acer, what have you been up to? Uh, not much. As per usual. No, I've been. Uh, I've been. Uh, first, I read Norse myth. I read on Audible Norse mythology by Neil Gaiman. Uh, it's just a sort of collection of assorted tales from northern mythology uh and he f- he front loads what do you guys know about nordic mythology i know yggdrasil and i know the rainbow bridge yeah and i know there's giants yeah there's a few uh, titans no titans is no, that's greek greek mythology but the giants are fighting like Odin and his sons and brothers, I think. Yeah. They're all they're all hassling each other. Yeah. Yeah. Daniel, what 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 is your knowledge of this? Not much. Not much. Okay. So uh like every Icelandic child, I've had to dissect this crap to finish my education. You cannot get into college with Iceland in Iceland unless you know uh, how Ymir, for example, how he was fed in the void of Kinnungagap. Do you know how he was? 
No. He drank cow's no. milk. What? There was one cow in the in the entire void of existence. There was one cow, and he drank from her. And this book is just a bunch of nonsense. But <laughs> <laughs> not the book. The story is just a bunch of nonsense. Um, but, but by the way, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, I just linked in the the chat, and for anyone listening, you might want to check this out. Um, there is a nearly three hour discussion between um, Bong Joon Ho. Sam Mendes, Martin Scorsese, Quentin Tarantino, and Takai Watiti. Um, you know, if you don't recognize some of these names, they're all like legendary directors. Uh, Bong Joon Ho did Parasite, for example. Um, uh, the, 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 this is this just looks really cool. Well, Taika, videos... Taika Waititi directed Thor Ragnarok, so I guess this is tangentially related. Go on. <laughs> sure. oh, there we go. There we go. So, yeah, uh, the video is called Meet the 2020 DGA Nominees for Theatrical Feature Film. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, there you go. A three-hour-long discussion between master class directors to consume. Enjoy. Anyways, continue. And also Taika yes, Waititi. <laughs> you got some beef with Taika? <laughs> I, I just didn't like Thor, Thor Ragnarok, but I'm I'm sure that's a movie that he wasn't fully behind. Like he, I think he said, uh, in order to make it in Hollywood, you need to make one movie for them and one movie for yourself. Uh, and I think Thor I Ragnarok think movies for was him. Not I think Thor one. Ragnarok is probably my favorite Marvel movie. Oh Jesus! Yeah. Even though that movie butchers uh, Norse mythology. Going back on subject, Daniel. <laughs> this came out of nowhere. I feel like I've been robbed. I feel like I was no, peacefully walking down an alleyway and somebody, uh, some punk came at me with a gun. <laughs> and yelled at you about the Oscars. <laughs> hey, hey, I just I just wanted to give the people, you know, some some really good worthwhile content because we're not giving as it to opposed them. to the content i was giving. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly anyways continue yeah uh anyway uh so i've uh n- not only have i had to read the original stories in the original ancient norwegian text i've read the ori- original scrolls which the text was transcribed on a thousand years ago um and neil gaiman he does a pretty good job of just making these stories work, uh, putting some structure into them, if you will, having a series of events which happen, which then pay off and play off each other. You know, it's not just, oh, Thor, they stole your hammer. So now you're going to go get it back. And how are you going to do that? Well, uh, how about we dress you like a woman and we try to marry you off and then you just take it back, which is the actual story. Now, this time around, it's like their character motivations. It's a bit more fleshed out. So, but he does also, he, he, he's very, uh, he's very careless with his sources. So he'll take some part of the story from the Etta, another one from the Heimskringl. He'll combine different versions of the story to make it work. And uh, yeah, I, I think if you're interested in all in Norse mythology, this is a really good introduction to that whole thing uh any questions daniel maybe about the oscars <laughs> no no you're fine yeah i'm fine i also have, i also have been reading some books by victor davis hansen he's a, he's an american military historian uh and i specifically i read the savior generals and culture and carnage uh, what do you guys know about these books? Nothing, I assume. Literally nothing. Literally nothing. Daniel? No. No. <sighs> Maybe you should clear no, these they're... topics with us first. <laughs> Maybe you boys should uh, should educate yourself, fools. No. Um, the Savior Generals, it's basically just... like He's a military historian, so he's just going over... Here are five historical military campaigns which were saved by last minute generals getting involved so he talks about the uh, Peloponnesian Wars where the Spartans and Athenians had to unite really to fight the Persians 
and everything was doomed and Athens was burning and everything was just crap. And then this weird outsider called Themistocles rose up and he was like, hey guys, let me just take care of this. I know what I'm doing. And then he talks about uh, the American Civil War and he talks about the sort of ascendancy of William Tecumseh Sherman and how he brought a psychological component into the war to break the spirit of the South. And it's uh, he talked about Belisarius of Byzantine. And it's just a really interesting sort of st- look at these very weird outsiders who were brought into the war at the last moment. And if not for them, history would have been completely different. So I really recommend that book. Uh, cool. And Carnage and Culture, it's basically just... I think the I think the heading of the book is Carnage and Culture, the ascent no uh, like important battles in the rise to Western power or something like that and it's basically he's going over again the Peloponnesian War uh, he's going where the sort of cradle of Greek democracy and the Hellenic states were rising up then he talks about how Alexander the Great sort of ruined everything the Greeks built. And then he talks about like Cortes with the Aztecs. And it's just, here's how Western powers historically fought their wars, completely devoid of any moral or philosophical uh, observations. It's just a really interesting look at the way they fought, the way they won, and the way they lost. So if you're interested at all in military history, I recommend picking up those two books. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Do you guys do you guys have any questions now? Nah. Nah. I guess I should have played a video game. Maybe you uh you ignorant fools would have had questions then. <laughs> yes, maybe. Maybe maybe we should talk about Thor Ragnarok. Did you like the one where Hulk punched Thor? I I don't really like Marvel movies, so I didn't watch it. I think I liked that part of the movie. I <laughs> I just like the part of the movie where it became a Marvel movie again. Yeah, I like it when it's sort of like a weird He-Man Flash Gordon movie. Yeah, I liked the part of the Marvel movie where it wasn't a Marvel movie. Yes, exactly. (laughs) When like Kate Blanchett comes back and she tries to take over the world or whatever. You know how I feel about Marvel movies? I feel like here's the hot how I how the how a lot of like curmudgeons felt when star wars first came out <laughs> like like these fucking kids with their fucking star wars <laughs> this is the death of cinema yeah but like but i'm not i don't i don't think i'm i've taken it quite to that point though i don't <laughs> think like marvel's like the death of cinema i just think the movies are kind of like loud and obnoxious yeah. and boring i think if there is a death of cinema it's not marvel it's all the other idiots who are trying to copy marvel oh let's make a dark cinematic universe let's cram together all the mushy monsters from the 50s and let's make a cinematic universe nobody wants to see that like nobody yeah. on the planet wants to see dracula and Mr. Hyde and the Invisible Man team up to fight whom? Well, to be fair, it can't be the death of cinema because cinema has officially survived the dark universe. Yes, Yes. (laughs) all all seven attempts or whatever there have been. No, I'm saying if if there is a decline in cinematic in cinema quality attached to Marvel, I don't think it can be pinned on Marvel. I mean, I wasn't being serious. It can be pinned on Disney. Yeah, I I think you can definitely put it on Disney. Mm -hmm, Yeah, with these fucking garbage live-action remakes. Ah, (laughs) Get that trash out of my face. It's Aladdin, but it's Aladdin again. And all the magical qualities which animation brought out of it. (laughs) Oh, that's just gone. Oh, you think we're gonna make? Oh, you think we're gonna yeah. imbue it with the characteristics of live action and lean on those elements? Nope. I remember, like, I, I'd say, I'd say, Lion King is arguably worse in that regard because at least humans can emote. Oh yeah, lions can't. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're getting oh, a my. CGI Pokemon movie, and it looks terrible. Oh, <laughs> I, I remember some tweet I saw where it said like. 20 years of technological advancements 
have have made it possible for us to make the movie look worse. Yep. <laughs> oh my god. What are they thinking? Like is this the Pokemon company or did somebody get the rights to make this? Dude, um, I don't know. Anyways, Boken, what have you been up to? Uh, you know about Corona? Yes. Oh, yes. The beer from the Fast and the Furious movies. Was it in the Fast and the Furious <laughs> movies? Yeah. Is that why it has such a bad rep? I d- yeah. I, di- I didn't know they were in the Fast and Furious movies, but you didn't Corona, know Corona is a very popular drink in Miami. They, Vin Diesel, every other scene, he's like talking to Kurt Russell and he'll just open up a fridge and he's like, oh, you got some Coronas? And Kurt Russell goes, no, I've got some uh, two Burks. And Kurt, when, when Diesel is like, I only drink Coronas. And then he'll like, when he's making an action scene, he'll just crack open a, a, a glass bottle and he'll just shotgun an entire beer. It's ridiculous. Their sales are down. Did you know that? People yes, don't want to drink Coronas because of the virus. Because of the coronavirus, yeah. That's yeah. That's you know dumb. you know what else is <laughs> fucking funny? Um people are now buying like just clearing out the, the uh grocery markets around here because they, they think the world is gonna go under. And I've yeah. seen screenshots of like the entire um shelf of of canned food being just out of stock. Except for a bunch of Chinese noodle soups. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> because people are so stupid. <laughs> the, the coronavirus is in the noodles! Transfer through the soup. Uh, uh, they're hatching their bets, man. What, do you, what can you say? <laughs> hey, they're, they're, they're just being very cautious yes did you know you need to uh change your your face masks every day um, or they stop working oh really yeah why because there's some kind of filter in there and that filter stops working at some point like it's they're, they're not for for weekly use uh, planned ap- planned obsolescence, if you ask me. Greedy mask manufacturers. Anyway, I looked into it, and basically, there's no point for you to there. There's no way for you to avoid getting infected if it should happen. Yeah, no, it's even like a mask isn't a good way to stop the virus. The best thing you can do is just, uh, isn't it, just to wash your hands? Yes, all the time, and don't touch your eyes, and don't touch your nose, and don't touch your mouth. Oh, man, I'm always touching my nose. Yeah, me too. And my eyes keep itching. Mm. And I'm always doing like with my mouth, so I can't I can't <laughs> stop touching my mouth. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you remember Corona. Do you also remember how I also always not talk about Street Fighter, even though I play it like what? 40 hours a week? You like, you like Street Fighter, right? Yeah. But oh, you wow. guys have forbidden me to talk about it. We should also forbid Yu-Gi-Oh. What? I I haven't brought up Yu-Gi-Oh at all. <laughs> was it was were we recording when I talked about it or Oh yeah, we were. Damn it. <laughs> so anyway, but yes, I was practicing uh, for tournaments. The uh, first tournament I was going to go to tournaments? were for Street Fighter. What tournaments? Oh, you like Street Fighter? Yeah. And now the tournament has joke. been canceled. Was gonna happen uh, uh, like late in March. I was gonna go to Brussels, and now it's dead. And I'm very afraid that because like the there's a Capcom Pro Tour season for the entire year, and then at the end of the year, the guys with the most points throughout the year are gonna go to the USA and play the big tournament, right? And there's two halves of the Capcom Pro Tour. And I'm afraid that at least the first half of the Capcom Pro Tour up until Evo in uh, in summer is just going to get canceled altogether. Mm. In the year where I, where I made a promise to myself to become a competitive player. And that's that kind of annoying. I mean, you know, it's no one's fault, but it really just sucks. It's China's fault now. 
Um, I'm wondering, <laughs> Street Fighter is uh, it's on. You can play online, can't you? Well, yes, of course. But the fun. Why don't you just host the tournament online? Because it's not the same. The netcode isn't very good, and just that little bit of delay. It it it, nice. it just plays differently online. Is it, uh, is it Dark Souls bad delay? No, no, no. It's oh, it's playable online, but you have very shoddy connections. Yeah. To like even to people in in Italy and Spain, it can become very laggy, and then it it just when there's lag, you know, uh, you it, know about the Spanish internet, right? Yeah, but apparently my internet is terrible too, even though I pay sixty bucks a month for it. Whatever. Whoa, um, I pay like a hundred bucks. Oh, I didn't. I I really wouldn't want to play you. I'm sure that's going to be an <laughs> awful connection. No, we have the second fastest internet in the world. Yeah, but you're very far sense. away. Yes, I am. And the problem is with just a little bit of delay when, like, you need to make split-second reactions and the moment you can't do that consistently, certain strategies in the game become more viable than they would be offline. So offline is where mm. everyone wants to be. And then also, you know, you just want to wanna go to these tournaments and you want to play the best, best Street Fighter players overall because everyone's going to be there and you want to play casuals with them and do money matches. Yeah. That's the goal, but uh, not happening now, I guess. And that also means, which I'm even more bum bummed out about, is that if these tournaments don't happen, I don't have any tournaments to watch at home. You know, I was going to go to the European tournaments, but if the ones in Asia and the US get cancelled, like there's going to be no Street Fighter on the weekends. What the fuck am I going to watch? This sucks. Everything about this sucks. And also, I hold up my you know, channel for you this. Know, uh, yeah, you know, Bogan, uh, there are people dying in the world because of Corona. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, it has just geez. become such an important part of my life, you know. And now it's all yeah. crumbling. And we're looking at a very good season of Street Fighter where the balance is good. The characters are fun. It's just had it all been going uphill. What do you think this will do to Yu-Gi-Oh tournaments? I assume the same. Yeah. I mean, surely there's the same tournament structure where people just travel around the world. Yeah, there is. It's like the Street Fighter tournament isn't the only one that has been canceled. There have been a lot of other events already been canceled and flights and whatever. It's just yeah. the, the world is just coming to a, to a standstill right now. You know what? I don't want to make this political, but somebody should have built a wall already. No. Ah. <laughs> ha, ha, ah. Ha, ha, ha. You know, uh... <sighs> <laughs> wow, you are exasperated. <laughs> uh, I, uh, the Israelis are saying they are close to a vaccine, so we can, we can see what that, where that turns out. Yeah, I'm hoping for the the second half of the season. Yeah. There's a bunch of tournaments in London and Cologne. Whatever, let's Cologne. see. So let's that see. has been happening. And also I've been playing a game called Ring Fit Adventure. I'm not sure if you guys know that one. I do. I've heard of it. I I, I almost bought it once, but uh, I, I, I didn't it's do it. It's kind of expensive, it obviously. Is it a, yeah, uh, that, that's why. Is it like a Wii Fit game? Yes, but on the Switch. Ah, on the Switch. And it's basically a fitness RPG. Um, what? Yeah, yep. it has RPG elements yeah, you, you, and you're fighting monsters. You have, like a, you have like a a ring, like an elastic a Pilates ring, ring that you put your joy... Yeah, you put the, the Joy-Cons on it so that the... Oh, the I've game seen can, that. Can track your motions. I've seen that. Yeah, you have one one yeah. Joy-Con in the ring, and then you have the other Joy-Con in a uh, strap around your your leg, and that's how it can tell where your legs are and where your ah. where your arms are because your arms are holding the ring, and that's how it can tell how you're doing the exercises. I didn't know that. Could I, uh, I could I that. play this game sitting on the couch if I didn't want to do the exercises? No. What? Well, Why? What's the point That's of no. Playing the game then. The, the game is particularly well written or anything. <laughs> I mean, 
What, but that would defeat the purpose of yeah. the game. The game is supposed to get you off your butt and exercising. Oh. But apparently... I just feel like that's sort of exclusionary to my... Uh... I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> keep, keep, keep going. I don't know where I'm going with this bit. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's good. Like, I started exercising. Um, I don't get to it as often as I want to. But there's just... Just about all the functions you want are there. And the only thing that kind of bothers me is that after a session where I'm like bleeding and sweating, and then it tells me I've... Bleeding? Well, it's hyperbole. Oh. Um, and then it tells me... I was going to say, what the fuck are you doing? it tells me I've only burned like 150 calories. Hmm. Uh, even though the like I, I put the adventure on the hardest difficulty and it is genuinely uh, exhausting to do that, but I don't know. Apparently, Pilates itself doesn't burn that many calories. That's like that's like eating half a slice of pizza. Sure, it's not much. I mean, when I re- when I run on the treadmill, um, and I run like two miles, that's three hundred calories on average. Yeah, I mean, I but it's also, I mean, there's running in there. Like you, you enter a level and it's you start just jogging through the level. And then there come, there, you get to th- some stairs or like a, a swamp. And then you need to r- raise your legs very high for the character to get further. And then you can uh, pull or push the ring to like shoot a, a to shoot air to hit some objects where maybe you will get some coins or whatever. And then at some point you meet a monster on the way and then you get into a turn-based battle where your attacks are you doing a bunch of exercises. And okay. that's... That sounds so like far, fun. that's the game. I'm, I, I finished the first level and the second level is beating my ass. So I needed to grind the first level a bit more. And that's where I am right now. I think I, yesterday I did a grinding session and I think I'm high level enough now to just try the second world. That sounds like fun. It's, it's a, yeah, it sounds it like a fun It seems like game. a good way to just exercise. And also, I mean, it's not only burning calories. It doesn't seem to be that great for that. But also, it's just, you know, the exercise itself. You're doing a bunch of... You're, you're, you're strength yeah, building. And you're, you're stretching yourself. You can pick your exercises so you can focus on certain areas of your body in one session. And yeah, it's, it's just... Glutes. It, it's... A fairly Lats. low com- commitment uh, way of exercising, which I enjoy. Nice. Cool. That's good. Yeah. Anything else? No. I think that's it. You didn't want to talk All about right. uh, the Mayhem game? Hold on. No. Volson? I think I'm going to skip that one. Okay. All right. Okay, then. Well, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back with the essay topic, did games writing have a turning point? So we're going to be right back. Welcome back, everyone. We are... Brewing some espresso right about now. No. Getting ready to no. answer. I already the... drank my coffees. Well, and I don't drink coffee. Fuck off. We need to rename stop this ru- podcast. Stop, ru- stop ruining it. No, shut up. <laughs> stop. Bru- Brewing the coffee, espresso. It's the coffee That's the motif. Podcast. Coffee. The game's and- writing have a turning point. <laughs> <laughs> That's the question. So this kind of. As I said before, it sprang from the Last of Us discussion because a lot of people seem to think that game was the turning point for games writing, and I think that's a bunch of horseshit. I think it was the turning point for normies realizing games could have good writing. For normies? Yes. Yes. I specifically chose that word. I was very careful in my (laughs) deliberation of that phrase. Chose my words very carefully. But yeah, um, uh, astute 
ivory tower elites such as ourselves will know that video games have had good stories for a while now. And did they? Uh, yes, they are you did. Sure? I am okay. sure. Damn sure. Damn sure. Rhymes, but yeah. Um, and now what? that's not to say that games with really good writing was the norm. Oh. It certainly wasn't. Exactly. Most that's games. Point. Most games. Most games had bad writing. What? Or at the, or at the very least, the writing was an excuse for the gameplay, and it just existed for the sake of it. Yes. Okay, I'm not sure if I would, should ask this general question at the beginning of the discussion or at the end, but so we we all agree that games writing used to be mostly bad, right? We oh, we yeah. agree on that. Would sure. you also say sure. that games writing is mostly good now? Or that it has mostly no. improved. I would say it's. Mo no. I would say it has improved. It has improved in the I would past ten years. I would years, say. Right? I, I would say games writing now is mostly average. Yes. I would also uh, like to ask, just for clarification, as we explore this topic, when we say writing, are we including like ludo narrative, or are we just talking about the actual writing of? I think no. We're talking about the quality of the storytelling, the quality of the dialogue, um, what messages to, the, the the story is trying to convey. You know, like we're just looking at it from like it's just as I a would, whole. Did, yeah, but I, that so, that means the narrative, doesn't it? If you you need yeah, to also bring in the mechanics and the technical details of the game. So that's uh, so the question really is, uh, did story presentation in games have a turning point no i think it's it's, no. it's genuinely writing um i would say there was a turning point for presentation and that i think the i don't know if it was the first but it was definitely the most influential that would have been metal gear solid on ps1 yes uh i think like every game for like a generation or so it seemed like was really drawing from that game uh, like Kojima was, the, I think, at least one of, if not the first, to add a cinematic language to the cutscenes. That was not really a thing beforehand. No. There was also the uh, the just idea of game as movie really sprung into life with Metal Gear Solid. It had been done yes. before, but not with any game that sold six, six or seven million copies or whatever. Yeah, like, I'd say before that, um, I guess you could argue FMV games like uh, Phantasmagoria tried to do that, mm -hmm. but, so I guess it's not fair to say Metal Gear Solid was the first one. Maybe the first for, like, with actual graphics, because FMVs are, you know, they're, they're video clips, but, like, I, I don't... I'm not like super well versed in FMB games, so I don't know how many or how well they were at conveying the story through cinematic language. But but like but the question isn't which was the first. The question is the t what was there a turning point? And I don't think there was a turning point because of the FMB games. No. Whereas I would say there was a definite turning point when Metal Gear Solid came. But for story but, writing, yes. Y yeah. Well, see, what? turning point. Turning point does not necessarily imply that story writing has gotten better, but there was definitely a change in the way stories in video games are presented with Metal Gear Solid. Yes. Whether or not that change works for the good for good or bad. Well, okay, but we also agree that games writing has become better in the past yeah. whatever years. Yes. So there's I don't know if that's a turning point or not, but we also should ask how we came to that. Hmm. I don't know if there was a turning point per se. I think it was more of a grad for right. Again, when, when we're talking about Metal Gear Solid, I think that's more so in terms of the cinematic language of video game cutscenes. Not, but with writing, I don't think there was like that one game that came out that changed everything. I think that was more of a of a gradual process. Yeah. Like, because you can look at Metal Gear Solid and you could see a clear shift. You can look at it 
see like, okay, there weren't really any games that were doing what it did before, but suddenly all the games after started to uh, copy it. But I don't really think there's a a game you can point to that was like, oh man, this game was like the the best written game up to this point, and then afterwards, every every other game was trying to. Call. I don't think that happened. No, I think I can do that I'm... with the Legacy of Kane saga, but I feel like the Legacy of Kane saga didn't have strong influence on the rest of the the medium. Yeah, like Metal Gear Solid was a huge hit. Metal Gear Solid was huge. Legacy of Kane was more niche. It was not to say not this. Not to say that Legacy of Kane didn't have any influence at all. But, I mean, it, it, was, it was popular enough that they did want to go with like one game, one game every year. They they annualized the series for five entries, or like I guess three. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it it was popular enough for that. It became basically a rival to Tomb Raider. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't think it ever got that big. I mean, in in the for for the status of uh, Eidos and Crystal Dynamics, you know, it it didn't get that big in its mainstream appeal or whatever. But I think it says something that the Soul Reaver probably in particular, so Soul Reaver One, was popular enough and sold well enough mm-hmm. that they really wanted to milk that franchise. I would also. Sure. Uh, I would also note, though, that you have games like Half Life, which uh, it didn't it didn't really create its own genre, and it wasn't the best representative of its genre when it launched. I don't think, but that game, also like Metal Gear Solid, really changed the way those sorts of games, those sort of first person story driven games, were written yeah. too. That uh, was more in yeah in the PC world. Yeah, but those are still video games. Come on. I'm not, I'm not say I'm not saying they are. I'm not saying they're not, but I would say PC gaming. The further you go back, the more niche PC gaming got. Yeah, like you could say System Shock One, incredibly well written, but did anybody play it? No. Nope. I I remember reading something that said that when they first released System Shock, that it only sold like twenty thousand copies. Yes. You know why? Because they sold it on like floppy disks and it was like 17 of them and there was like half the content of the game or whatever was missing. (laughs) (laughs) And then they like six months later they released it on CDs and then the appeal was completely dead. It's ridiculous. But um, when, when we ask was there a change in game writing, like was there a turning point yeah, obviously there were many turning points though, because you 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 used to have like in terms of presentation, you used to have uh, it was just platformers, and then all of a sudden you have RPGs. So, I I wonder, do we are we going to focus solely on writing here, just for the sake of having a bit of bit more emphasis on what we're talking about? I mean. I think mechanics are part I'm, of the I'm, writing. So if sure, someone, yeah, someone asks then, you to, to write about the story of a game, yeah, that's what we're talking w- about, whatever that means. Yeah, but, but see, then I would say, no, there wasn't a turning point because it's always been a gradual shift. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to say. That it, there, It's a gradient. It's not like all of a sudden... There was no one game that was... That like Metal Gear Solid... There was no, there wasn't that one game that you can point to and go, "Aha, no. this is the turning point." Yeah, like you have, uh, oh, here's Dragon Quest, and now there's a bunch of RPGs, but that that was just that added to the sort of fabric of how video games are presented. It didn't fundamentally change everything. Uh, Dragon Quest fundamentally changed RPGs. Sure. But, but that's not but that's not necessarily the same as saying that it changed storytelling. No. Especially since the original Dragon Quest was su- supremely simplistic. You know, and that's not a knock against the game. It's like one of the first RPGs ever made. Like, you know, it's totally fine that it was super simplistic. Yeah. But 
it is it, it was because by virtue of it being like one of the first rpgs that it it, it got the ball rolling uh, for more elaborate storytelling over time because rpgs lend themselves more to better writing yes it was also because back in the day uh japanese games had just had a natural advantage because of kanji being able to took less space to tell more story yeah i mean there there ted woosley who translated a bunch of squaresoft and uh i believe even enix rpgs over the years he had horror stories about how he <laughs> he had like pages and pages and pages like hundreds of pages of translated dialogue and when when it came time to actually put all of that onto a cartridge physically couldn't do it because it just wouldn't fit <laughs> you know he had that problem with seeker of mana he had that problem with chrono trigger like who knows how much like wait have detail we, is missing have we since gotten a better translation of those games uh the ds version of chrono trigger oh, okay. i believe does have a, an updated translation okay um and i believe there is also a fan translation that is cuz the thing with the ds version um it kind of goes half and half where it tries to be uh it tries to add in and be more true to the original script while also not removing like Woos Ted Woosley's like uh more charming like localization quirks. Mm. So it was kind of like a weird half and half. And I think there's a fan translation out there that is a lot more true to like the the original script. Um like Final Fantasy 7 is another example. I always go back to that where like the trans like on top of just like just being a really bad translation, just like in terms of grammar. It's, yeah, spelling errors. To, oh yeah, tons of typos. Like, there's so much that's just not conveyed. Like, did you, like, I, I think I've said this to you before, but I'm going to ask the audience, did you know that, uh, that Reeves was supposed to have a fucking accent? <laughs> he's, he's supposed to speak with an accent. And that isn't conveyed at all, aside from one line of dialogue where he's uh, he's pretending to be uh, like Cat Sith at the same time. And, and he's talking in like a boardroom with um, a few other characters. And one of the characters was like, oh, you know, why is your voice so funny? <laughs> but that doesn't make any any sense in, in the in the original like translation because there, it wasn't conveyed up to that point that he spoke with an accent so when she's asking him why are you why are you speaking funny for you for, for the players just like what the fuck does that mean i hope they keep that in the remake i hope they don't give him an accent but then still have a character ask him why are you speaking funny uh but but i mean I, this also this also makes it hard for us, especially, to judge the quality of the writing, particularly for older Japanese games, because I think people really underestimate how much is lost mm. in a bad translation. And, I'll, you know, and again, in Ted Woosley's case, it's not really his fault. It was the limitations of the hardware. But sometimes a bad translation is just a bad translation. And a lot of the original intent is gone. Maybe Ted Woosley should have tried a bit harder, though. <laughs> Damn. I, I go back to that complaint a lot. That's a very bad complaint to have. That's <laughs> such a bad maybe you should Maybe you should try harder <gasps> and come up with a better complaint. Did you hear that, Bogan? He, 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 he gutted me? Me. You. Me, who was once considered a YouTube prodigy, <laughs> I've now been gutted like a fool. I thought you were going to say gutted like a fish. <laughs> uh. So obviously, game writing didn't get good with The Last of Us or any other game. I mean, you can... I, I, I think at the very least... Point, 
we can agree it was not the last of us did now here's the thing i would say the last of us did have impact oh yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't want to be completely unfair to The Last of Us. I would I would say that The Last of Us uh it, it raised the bar a little bit, right? Like it it at the very least it made the industry kind of look at it and go, we need to up our game now. But yes. then again, so, so did Dark Souls. Or the Souls game in general. I mean that's another another style of writing the story in these yes. very cryptic uh, uh, environmental ways that also yes. found its like found popularity and now it's like sometimes I, it gets yeah, mixed see, some games are very souls-ish in their storytelling some games want to be a sad dad game <laughs> the souls games definitely popularized it but the souls games weren't the first to do that yeah well you no, can always say that. that but last of us wasn't the first to do its thing either and see yes. this is all of these games, you can even point to like, uh, I remember people talking about environmental design when Bioshock came out. None of these didn't, they didn't create the stuff they made people take aware, take notice of. They just sort of. Dra yeah, Dragon Quest wasn't away. the first, Dragon Quest wasn't the first RPG either. I believe the first RPG was Alcalabeth. Yeah, but, but that shit doesn't matter because we're talking about a turning point. And for a turning point to happen, you need to have a game that has a lot of influence, influence that influences other developers and writers to uh, change their work for them. If that's the you know, case, then yes. I would say there have been multiple turning points. Yes, I think I'd agree with that. Like, um, going back to Final Fantasy VII, I'd argue that was a turning point. Yes. I think, uh, you know, especially for RPGs, like, uh, I remember listening to an interview with um, our, our good buddy, friend of the podcast, Chris Avalone. My friend, not your friend. Oh, come on. Uh, <laughs> he was in he was an interview and he was talking about how much he loved Final Fantasy VII and Chrono Trigger and he loved, uh, you know, the stories <laughs> in those games. And that it had an impact on him. And uh, even, like, something down to, like, the spell animations had an impact on, like, the graphics, uh, like, the special effects designer in Planescape Torment. Like, apparently that guy loved the spell animations of Final Fantasy VII and, you know, took a lot of inspiration uh, in them for, for Planescape. But, you know, that there... You're right. There are multiple turning points you have for Skate. writings and games. Boulder Skate Two, like if we, if we, uh, yeah, one of them. Yeah, that that's maybe more of a which way. Boulder Skate Two. Baldur's Gate, yeah. okay. Like Baldur's Gate Two popularized the role playing romance, and also the general focus on. Um, actually, I'm not sure because I think Planescape Torment came out the same year or year before that. I want to say. But both those games made um, the the companions a an integral part of the Western RPG. Mm -hmm. But then you have something like uh, like I want to say Morrowind, I want to say Oblivion, but it was Skyrim, I think, that sort of popularized its presentation. Okay, here's here's a a side question. I'm trying to think about games before twenty. 10 or 29 uh, yeah 29 that had really good writing and somehow i can only come up with rpgs can we come up with non-rpgs that had really strong writing uh system shock one ghost trick okay uh actually actually wait ghost trick literally came out 2010 well, Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> how about a how um, about a majora's mask or a uh, shadow of the colossus like a team eco mm, game yeah okay uh what about Phoenix Wright? Thief, I'd say. Thief? Yeah, Thief. Oh, yeah. The whole, I mean, I haven't, what play, are we I haven't played the Looking Glass, Deus Ex, all those games. But that's an Looking RPG. Glass in general. Like, I haven't played those games, but sure. Uh, yeah, okay. Fine. <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, me personally, you guys can laugh at me, whatever. Fuck you. Tales of the Abyss. Look at this <laughs> fucking weep. <laughs> Tales, more like Tales of the Weep. <laughs> hey, hey, that that game deals... Acer, 
This game also, deals with the also same an, themes an RPG, as Berserk. Oh, you're right. Jesus it is an fuck. RPG. Fuck. <laughs> I'm an idiot. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Uh, fuck. Okay. Hmm. Um. Nine. Uh, when did nine 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 come out? What is nine nine nine? Yeah, it's a visual uh, novel. I think that's before. It's yeah. like Nintendo DS. Yeah, it's, a, it's like a DS game. Eight or something. You also have games like, uh, you know, Metal Gear Solid, you know, Snake Eater. Sure. That sort of canon. Um, I'm looking over my... Okay, so... Oh, no. 999 came out 2012. Oh, really? Fuck. No, wait. That's Virtue's Last yeah, Reward. That one is, like, that's... Yeah. Okay. I okay, think Metal Gear Solid 2 can be considered if you look at the subtext of the game. Okay, yeah, so 999 subtext, came out 2009. Take, why, wouldn't we, why wouldn't you take Snake Eater then? What, the third one? Yeah. Uh, sure. uh, I mean, I really like Snake Eater. I think it's a bit goofy. Yeah. Okay, but the, I like I like the goofiness. Sure. Yeah, I guess that's the point where we start like arguing subtext, about what is that's a part what of the charm. Good this, we shouldn't. Yeah, but it's also the game. Care, the game has a really dark message, which it just plays off as really silly, about how that's true. Soldiers are just tools of the context of the times in which they find themselves. Yeah, I. That's true. I think the game has some weaker parts. Also, I mean. So, oh, some yeah, of the bosses, <laughs> some of the dialogue. I am, I am the pain. I shoot bees from my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I love that aspect of Metal Gear Solid yeah. Three. Like, it, it it gives it so much charm. Like, I it, I don't think I would like the game or find it nearly as memorable if it didn't have all that goofy shit in it. Yeah, it's that. It's that. Kojima is really good at strat at like <laughs> walking the line between serious tom clancy devotion to realism and saturday morning cartoons and i don't know how he does it you know i respect people that say metal gear solid 2 is their favorite but i always i always stick with metal gear solid 3 because i feel like it embodies all of the, uh, the good aspects of Kojim, kojima's writing like yeah it's over the top and silly and goofy and dumb but it also is very like it conveys some really human emotions in, in like in really palpable ways, and it, it's just like this combination of elements that works in ways that like feel overindulgent and stupid and insipid in like Metal Gear Solid Four. Yeah, and talking about translations, Metal Gear Solid Two was translated by a woman who hated Kojima and his writing. Yeah, that's true. And I think she had like only like a few weeks to do it too. Like, you know, give her props. Like, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And she was fueled by hatred. So that's that's <laughs> that's fucking. You know, that's fucking awesome. Like, I kudos to her. So what I'm taking from this is that RPGs basically always had strong writing, and kind of other genres sort of picked up the slack and I, caught up. I mean, I would, I would. I wouldn't say always, unless you mean like comparatively. I mean, like, of course, there are RPGs with bad writing, but all these standout examples, also Legacy of Kane, we forgot, but yeah. Um, no, no, we didn't forget. You yeah, but mentioned that's it. not an RPG, my point. But no, a lot of RPGs, RPGs had strong writing and are the standout examples before 2010, basically. And then. Mm -hmm. I yeah I would say, I would say that's definitely the case and I think it's because of the length of RPGs. That's not to say that you need length to tell a good story, but I would argue because there's uh, RPGs are longer um, and there's so much dialogue for these characters that even if all the writing isn't great, you know, spending so much time with these characters, it it gives the writers the opportunity to flesh them out a lot and by the end you you have these characters that you've you've spent so much time with them you really feel like you know them because they feel so well defined and it also gives the the writers a chance to you know flesh out the world building it, it gives them an opportunity to make the worlds interesting and have different facets to how they work sure and this is it's, uh, it, yeah. it's interesting how writing ages a lot better than any component of 
any other component of video games uh, because it, writing, it's just writing. It doesn't really age. Whereas you look, mm-hmm. you play a Kingsfield, that game looks horrible, but back in the day, it was really atmospheric. Um, I would argue it's still atmospheric. Like, sh- sure, but I, I'm yeah. talking about comparatively. Like that, those visuals. Sure. You and I, we can have an appreciation of that really antiquated design style. I don't think the average person does. Yeah, and, I mean, and I would also. I say mean, that if you go back and play, if you go back and play Silent Hill one through four, like playing those games, they're not very fun. No, but but you can forgive that. Because the writing holds up in those games. Also, because they're not supposed to be fun. No, sure. Like, but like, e- even getting past the fact that they're supposed to, they're supposed to be tense horror games or whatever. The the clunky controls can make them like frustrating to to play if you're not used to it. Yeah, and that's also another aspect of those games. Which again, I have a lot of. A, I really like those clunky controls. I think they do a lot for those games, but. But if the if the writing wasn't good in the original four Silent Hill games, no one would remember them. Well, no yeah, one would care about them. Right, the writing in the Resident Evil games sucked. They, it sucked, but, but I, I but think it's forgivable in Resident Evil because in Resident Evil it gives them like that B horror movie cheese to in charm to them. Yeah, but the the gameplay is good enough. Like you can just you play the remake uh, Resident Evil remake. It's basically the same game, mostly, but they just changed the story. Mm. But uh, well, they also changed the layout of the Spencer Mansion. Yeah, I, I, I should, I, I point again, like mostly, it's th- the gameplay and stuff. That's mostly sort of preserved, polished, but it's mostly preserved. Yes. So that, okay. that's the sort of pure essence of that experience. Um, and that's also that's a presentation, though, not so much writing where they added mm-hmm. they sort of gave games that you can do atmosphere you can do those sort of tensions tense moments that comes from horror games uh but there, so so how do we there's one more one big point i want to make which is i yes. i think there has been a turning point in games writing which is the uh, advent of indie gaming as a whole Oh, since yeah. since twenty nine, yeah, that, that's an, uh, yeah, I I I'd, I'd say that's another turning point to throw yeah, in there. And that's like that's that genuinely had a big influence on the games writing development as a whole because indie games are so not by the books in a lot of cases that games have become a lot more experimental. I feel like. And also, yeah. what kinds of stories are being told has has just widened in general, and that's why I think yeah. I think why the reason why we uh, consider RPGs to have all that good writing, but all the other genres not as much, is because games up until 2010, I feel like often still fell into that ho- that hole of you know there needs to be a good guy and a bad guy, and they need to fight at the end. And there needs to be a lot of combat, and there needs to be a lot of enemies to kill, and that has kind of been, you know, by a lot of indie games, has just been undercut by other gameplay yeah. styles and gameplay ideas. There's obviously yeah, uh, the, there's obviously the, exceptions, but of course, it's, it's really it's really in the sort of seventh gen where the idea of a complicated story becomes the norm rather than a really highlight example. And the, the benefit that indie games have is that they don't need to be shackled by the restrictions uh, th- by uh, that other games do because they don't have a publisher that's breathing down their neck like, why doesn't this game have guns? Yeah. You know, like, why doesn't this game have this? Like, indies can make the games, you know, not however they want. They have their own limitations, but they, they're they free to do things that other game developers wouldn't be able to because of certain expectations that of, uh, of what a video game is supposed to be. So it allows them to explore avenues that... Indie games don't they, need to recover you know. $200 million budgets. Yes. I wonder if it's ever be, happened you know. that the, 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 the producer was like, well, what if we, you know, make it a bit more tender? We make the main character more tender and we try to communicate... A depth of character, and the developers like, we just want to make it about shooting, yeah. where you have the roles reversed. 
I mean, that's I guess that's possible, <laughs> but I would say that because of this, the indie the indie movement has also affected uh, the mainstream media as well. I don't know if there's like a specific game or crop of indie games that Minecraft. you can point to. Not Minecraft. You could point to Minecraft. You could point to uh, also Amnesia, The Dark Descent. Sure. Limbo, I'd say. I mean, I hate that we game, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> also, another important uh, writing milestone, of course, The Last of Us Season 1. Uh, not The Last of Us. Uh, the Walking, Walking Dead, Dead Season 1. Walking Dead. Yeah, that game is good. Yeah. I would put Soma up there, even though I'm not sure how much it has influenced games. I would say Amnesia more so than Soma. True. I would say I think Soma is great, but it it's like it's in the vein of Amnesia. I would I think Amnesia is arguably more influential, but, but Soma, Soma is, is, has, is a better yeah, story. Has way much more story, right? Yeah, but yes, uh, yeah, but influence wise, sure, it's Amnesia that changed it. No, yeah, Amnesia had way more influence. Um, and the precursor to Amnesia, the Penumbra Games, also had some interesting stories. Not not always perfect, not always great, they were, but they, I, defi- definitely interesting. I think those games are very underrated, but I, I know underrated, they, they didn't have that much of an influence. No, they, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. They, they didn't have influence, they were pretty niche, but they were definitely very cool, interesting games. I think we've come to an agreement that, that there was no single turning point for games writing that... It that games writing has gone through multiple turning points. We've had multiple games and eras that have had uh, profound influences on uh, games writing as a whole. Can we? I, I think we've uh, established yes. that. Yeah, but also, also we agree also that a... games writing has become better overall, and we're living in a yes. In generations yeah. that have yeah just a higher standard of games writing, and it's still not very high. Yes, it's it's not as high I, I would say compared to other mediums. Uh, personally speaking, I think that there's a lot of untapped potential due to the interactivity of games as a medium that haven't been really taken into account yet. There are definitely a lot of games I have, but I don't think it's been tapped into as much as it should in order to really explore some very interesting uh, like narrative ideas that really plays into the strengths of video games as a medium that uh, can't be replicated in other ones. I would say, though, that... But that's games, a totally separate topic. I would say video game writing is better than in most mediums. Have you seen... Have you seen movies? They're horrible. They're terrible. <laughs> 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 I mean, there are a the lot of terrible movies Disney with bad Slop, writing. Maybe. I recently got Disney+, Plus and I've been watching every movie, and they're all terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I would say that... Uh, I would say that games writing, on, as on an average, is higher quality than what you find elsewhere. Mm, I would, I would disagree say with I would, that heavily. I don't. I, well, I would. I, I would say I would, this. I would say this. I think games writing on a, uh, as a whole is better than people give it credit for. The average movie sucks. You guys know this. Like the <laughs> average movie is not Bong Joon Ho's. Uh, Parasite? Parasite. Parasite's fucking great. Yeah, but that's not the average movie. The average no, movie is it's not. The average movie is Nicolas Cage being transformed into a dog for four <laughs> for ninety minutes. No, it's not. The average games story is like a a C tier movie idea. The average video game is like you gotta go there and you gotta kill this guy, and also here's your here's your child. Yeah. Go the get the fucking like, MacGuffin. Yeah, the average movie is like, but uh, we uh, here's 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 uh, this fucking actor, and this is a vehicle to promote him, and it's terrible. <laughs> uh, okay, I okay, I, I know, I think I know what. A- Hold on, I think I know what Acer's trying to say. <laughs> I think you need to watch I think more Ace movies. Acer's just talking bullshit. <laughs> Someone calls him out. No, 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 no. Listen, I think this is what he's trying to say. Most game stories nowadays are functional. Most movie stories I th- suck. 
that's... because they're trying to be more than functional and in try and in in that ambition they end up like failing a lot harder while most video game stories at the very least just try to make sense and be a good excuse for the gameplay and then and then just like meeting that expectation automatically makes it better than something that tries to be more and I, fails i totally agree disagree with that i think games I'm not. I'm not saying I okay. agree with him. I'm saying that's his that's, argument. That's not my argument. <laughs> okay, I, I thought that's what you were trying to I say. Think my I argument def- is that yes, I think there's like a baseline expectation of quality for video games that is higher than the baseline expectation of quality for movies. Okay, and I'm not saying I'm not saying games writing is great. I'm just saying it's like you have respect for characterization. You don't always have you. You rarely have that in movies. I, I see. The reason I disagree with, I mean, I have a higher standard. I may be wrong. I haven't watched. I, every I movie. have a standard, a higher standard for video games in the sense that I want them to, to to, like, to get to where movies are already. And it's not a fair comparison, but like in terms of sensible character writing having your game have themes and scenes that further those those themes and just not, in terms of just pacing video game video yeah. games have awful pacing in terms yeah, I'm, of I'm story not writing pa- because I'm not, there's I'm not so com- much I'm not pacing. comparing I'm not comparing okay, the pa- best of video games with the best of movies no, I think I'm saying the, movies are so much more developed I'm saying the average game is just better than the average movie I no the average movie was filmed. I think pacing uh, is a lot harder to talk about with games, though, because of the interactivity. Really fucks up pacing. Yeah, exactly. Like that, or at least, no, I mean the discussion of pacing because theoretically, a player can like spend an infinite amount of time dicking around and never progressing the story. And I don't really know if that's totally fair to take into consideration when it comes to I think to it is. I think if a lot of developers and, and publishers just... What are you guys... No, no, I'm making a point, you fuck. <laughs> I think if a lot of publishers <laughs> push these these gigantic 60-hour sandbox games and, and like the story always takes a backseat because you can do whatever the hell you want and you don't have to follow any mission objectives whatsoever and the pacing is just a, 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 a dumpster fire, then that's obviously a problem of games in general. And that's something where... I, I, that's not what happens in movies. No, but I, I, don't, I, well, don't think, no, I don't think... No, mo- because... I don't think it is as big a problem it- as people say because if the pacing doesn't trouble you in the moment while you're playing the game if you if the pacing is only a problem in retrospect i don't really think it matters that much yeah but it takes away from the writing i mean obviously obviously the pacing of a film pacing of a game are inherently different because a, a, a movie is a fixed thing you can't the only thing you can do to alter the pacing of a movie is to pause it or rewind it or fast forward it but then you're not watching it in the way that it was intended while with a video game, you you have a lot more agency in how you control the pacing. What do you guys think is like the average movie? Like if you had to put pick a movie which is like average. Like the quintessential... Average movie. Average movie? Yes. That's Oof. difficult to pick because uh, there's the, what's popular right now, but then there's also a lot of drama and horror movies. That, Marvel films? Yeah. <laughs> All right, what's the what's the quintessential average video game? Like Uncharted. Yeah, I think I feel, Uncharted no, 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 not is Uncharted because Marvel. Uncharted has been the the style of Uncharted has been moving aside. I think the that's true. I think it would be more like Assassin's Creed, maybe. No, not Assassin's Creed. I'm not. Uh, wait, I'm, I not, get, I'm not talking I about guess Far present, Cry. I'm not talking about presentation wise, guys. I'm talking about quality wise. Like what? What's the average quality movie, and what's the average quality video game? That's really hard to say. I think yeah. I think uh, Star Wars, think... the new Star Wars game, was very average. Okay, I, I'd I'd say the new Star Wars game was at least above average. It's a it's a it's a tall six or whatever. Yeah, it's a strong six. Strong are we six. looking for a five, or what are we doing? 
No, I'm, I'm. We're looking. We're looking for an average five. I'm. I'm just saying. I'm a decent five, not a strong five, not a weak five, a decent five. See, I would say, and maybe maybe I'm wrong here. I think the average video game is like. It's like a Battlefield One, right? Whereas the average, You're like okay, like a Call of Duty. No, I'm not not pre- I'm just the quality of the writing, completely of the writing. Yeah, of the writing of the presentation, completely divorced from the online. From all, I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying the quality of the presentation. The average game to me is like a Battlefield One, whereas the average movie to me is like an Ant Man. Oh, I was gonna say the same thing. That's also <laughs> what Red Letter yeah. Media keeps saying. And I think that the the uh, Battlefield One, that's just to me a higher mark of quality writing wise, presentation wise, than an Ant. I mean, I I don't like Ant Man, but it has clear main character with a sensible arc. It has set pieces. It has a beginning, yeah. a middle, and end. Battlefield One has those things too. And then the why player, is Battlefield, Battlefield 1. One better? I think because it has it has those things, but it has them better. Ah, it has better writing than Ant Man. It has better characterization, better set pieces. I would say. Uh, this is you know this argument doesn't even work. I'm just saying. I think isn't the Battlefield One the game where you'd like put on a Warhammer 40k power armor and mow down hundreds of soldiers in 19 fucking whatever ten? Mm, maybe, but it's also <laughs> the game where you. <laughs> It's also the game where you play as that pilot who's like really richly characterized as like this scummy traitor, but then he has a heart of gold or does he? It's the one where you guys are fixing the tank to try to get the pigeon to deliver the message. Uh, you play as that Australian guy. But I'm just saying, I think, look, this has gotten, we've, this, this conversation has gotten out of control. <laughs> I just think the average game is a bit higher quality than the average movie. I mean, and look, I I, I, don't, I, I don't really don't think, know because I don't, I don't, think I don't really an watch to be had here. I think this is just personal taste. Sure, I was I was gonna say. I mean, I don't really watch a ton of movies anymore like I used to, so I don't even know how to gauge the the general quality of the average movie nowadays. Um, so I, I don't really have much of a say in this sure. And I, I uh, try to avoid movies that are average in general. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, only, I only go out of my way to watch a movie that like is like cream of the crop, like Parasite. Or, like, or Doctor Par- Strange. I mean, you, you either watch movies that are really good f- or really bad or something where you're invested in the franchise itself or the characters because... You watched, you enjoyed something like it before. Yeah, like Doctor Strange. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you bring up Doctor Strange? <laughs> I would actually. You know. oh, what about Star Trek two thousand nine? That seems like a very average movie. That I think that's a bit was. better than an average movie. Mm. Yeah, was it? it's like it's got I, a cracking pace. It's kind of like it moves. The characters, it, yeah, it had, a, it had a good sense of humor. It's to like it. a heightened so it reality. Then. Yeah, but it's like I don't know. I I think here's the thing. I think like a soup like the a, a average movie is like one that is so nothing that like you don't even remember it. You're just like, oh yeah, I watched that, and you don't really have any feelings about it one way or the other. At the very least, I can think back to Star Trek 2009 and be like, oh yeah, I had some fun with that. You know, I had some laughs. You know, it, it had some some f- some fun moments. Like a super average movie to me would just be a movie like, yeah, I saw it. I think a super average movie to me would be the Pikachu D- Detective Pikachu movie. Honestly, yeah. Who the fuck says Pikachu? What? <laughs> <laughs> it's Pikachu. <laughs> You're supposed to be the Pokemon fan here. You do realize that's Pikachu. a Japanese word, right? It's pronounced Pikachu. <laughs> no, it's not. Get it right. You're supposed uh, to get it right. Be here. It's Pikachu. No. Yes, yes, it is. It's Pikachu. That's it. Not Pikachu. <laughs> sure. I, I pronounce it the German way, okay? But you're... 
The German way is no, wrong. No wrong. Dude, English is the only language I, that matters, Americans okay? Keep fucking up foreign words and it makes me really upset. Like when when uh, Mike and Jay, uh, Mike and Rich from Red Letter Media keep saying Picard even though it's a French word and it's Picard. No, his name is Picard. What, what? are you talking about? Yeah, but his name is French. It's Jean yeah, Jean Luc Picard. They don't say that. Yeah, but but the, his name in the show is Picard. It's not yes, Picard. because That's some how they Americans say it. keep mispronouncing it in the show. No, because no. his name was English. It was Americanized. His name is English. It's it's French. He's from France. No, no, yeah, but he's an English guy, so you he, no. he would call him. <laughs> yeah, I was Picard. gonna say, is it is it? Wait, Picard is French. He, his name is Jean Luc. The fuck do you think? Yeah, but he he's. What is this? What is this conversation? What? <laughs> what? Are you, you know, you guys keep saying what? aluminum? The fuck is that about? Yeah, aluminum. It's, it's aluminium, you fuck. What do you say? Al- no, no, it's, it's aluminum. Aluminum. That's, aluminum. The, that's the element. No. It's called aluminum. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> what? Uh, next you're going to tell me a flashlight is a torch? <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. The fucking element is Get called aluminum. Get the fuck out of here. You even write it that way if you're not a dumb American. I'm sorry, we can't help it if we're right. Yeah, but Bogan, I wonder, is he this? I, I don't know if you're joking here or if you're being serious. About what? <laughs> About Picard. Why? <laughs> okay, if, if, because the character's name is Picard. Like, it's, it's been removed. No, just stop. We've, we've been talking about this for too long. <laughs> It's time to end the podcast. Do you, before we do, do you want a shitty take about uh, our, the average video game versus average movie? I don't. I have a very, no. I have a very good shitty take. The average no, video game. I'm tired of your bad takes. <laughs> the average that's, video game is an. <laughs> that's the, the uh, subtitle to this podcast. Is I'm tired Man, of your bad takes. If I want, dude, dude, if I want to see bad takes. I'd go on Twitter. Oh, just I, calling him out. I don't. I don't. I, I'm not calling anyone out. I'm calling <laughs> out Twitter. Why your bad take on, on Twitter? Here, here's my bad take. The average <laughs> video game is a nine out of ten. The average movie is a five out of ten. <laughs> because we have such shitty aggregate reviews. <laughs> uh, what are you guys working on? <laughs> I'm still working on my Tales of Styria video. I'm sorry that's taking a while, but... Um, Boken is... I, yeah. I assume you're working on a cure for the coronavirus. <laughs> yes, so I can go back, back to my Street Fighter tournaments. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Boken's on it. Um, Don't worry. You can you can keep buying your noodles. Boken's going to save it. Uh, I'm still doing the Demon Souls video. Took a bit longer than I thought, but they're coming. Picard. Dude, we're going to have this discussion once this podcast is off the air. I swear to fucking Christ. Yeah, but you are... I don't see how... I don't... I understand... I anyway, think I understand bye. your argument. <laughs> okay, but that's it, I guess. Yeah, bye. We're going to rush this off so we can have this talk. Bye-bye. <laughs>